Human Geography, 7th edition, chapter 2. The Changing Global Context. The story is told of a little Korean girl who arrives in Los Angeles, sees a McDonald's restaurant, tugs at her mother's sleeve and says, look mother, they have McDonald's in this country too. It has become a cliche about the 21st century that everywhere will come to look at, like everywhere else. With the same McDonald's Pizza Hut and Kentucky Fried Chickens, the same television programming with Hollywood movies and TV series, and the same malls sell selling the same Nike shoes, Phillips Electronics and GAP Cl Gap Clothing, another cliche, is that instantaneous global telecommunications, satellite television, and the internet will soon overthrow all but the vast, excuse me, last vestiges of geographical differentiation in human affairs. Large corporations, according to this view, will no longer have strong ties to their home country, scattering their activities around the world in search of low-cost, low-tax locations. Employees will work as effectively from home, car, or beach as they could in the offices that need no longer exist. Even halfway across the world will be seen, heard, and felt with the same immediacy as events across town. National differences and regional cultures will dissolve the cliche has it. A global marketplace brings a uniform dispersion of people, tastes, and ideas. Such developments are, in fact, highly unlikely. Even in the information age, geography will still matter and may well become more important than ever. Places and regions will undoubtedly change as a result of the new global context of the information age. But geography will still matter because of several factors, transport costs, different resource endowments, fundamental principles of spatial organization, people's territorial impulses, the resilience of local cultures, and the legacy of the past. In this chapter, we take a long-term, big-picture perspective on changing human geographies, emphasizing the continuing interdependence among places and regions. We show how geographical divisions of labor have evolved with the growth of a wide, worldwide system of trade and politics and with the changing opportunities provided by successful technology, technology systems. As a result of this evolution, the world is now structured around a series of core regions, semi perfial regions, and perfial regions. And globalization seems to be, <coughs> excuse me, intensifying many of the differences among places and regions rather than diminishing them. The pre modern world. The essential foundation for human geography is an ability to understand places, regions, and regions as components of a constantly changing global system. In this sense, all geography is historical geography. Built into every place and each region is the legacy of major changes in world geography. The world is an evolving competitive political economic system that has developed through successive stages of geographic expansion and integration. This evolution has affected the roles of individual places in different ways. It, also, it has also affected the nature of the interdependence among places. This explains why places and regions have come to be distinctive and how this distinctiveness has formed the basis of geographic variability. To understand the sequence of major changes in human geography, we need to begin with the hearth areas of the first agricultural revolution. Hearth areas. The first agricultural revolution involved a transition from hunter-gatherer groups to agricultural-based mini-systems that were both more extensive and more stable.
A mini system is a society with the reciprocal social economy, economy that is each individual specializes in particular tasks, e.g. tending animals, cooking or making pottery, and freely gives any access, ex excess product to others. The recipients reciprocate in turn by giving up the surplus product of their own specialization. Such societies are found only in substance based economies because they do not have or need an extensive physical infrastructure. Many systems are limited in geographical scale. The transition to many systems began in the Proto-Neolithic or Early Stone Age period between 9000 and 7000 BCE and were based on a series of technological preconditions, the use of fire to process food, the use of grindstones to mill grains and the development of improved tools to prepare and store food. The key breakthrough was the evolution and diffusion of a system of a slash and burn agriculture also known as Swidden Cultivation, see chapter nine. Slash and burn is a system of cultivation in which plants are harvested close to the ground. The subtle left to dry for a period and the then ignited, the burned stubble provides fertilizer for the soil. Another important breakthrough was the domestication of cattle and sheep a technique that had become established in a few regions by Neolithic times. These agricultural breakthroughs could take place only in certain geographic settings where natural food supplies were plentiful, where the terrain was diversified, thus offering a variety of habitats and species, where soils were rich and re relatively easy to till, and where there was no need for large-scale irrigation or drainage. Archaeological evidence suggests that the breakthrough took place independently in several agricultural hearth areas and that agricultural practices diffuse slowly from each. Figure 2.1. Hearth areas are geographic settings where new practices have developed and from which they have spread. The main agricultural hearth areas were situated in four broad regions. In the Middle East, in the so-called Fertile Crescent around the foothills of the Zagros Mountains, parts of present-day Iran and Iraq, along the floodplains of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, around the Dead Sea, Valley, Jordan and Israel, and on the Anatolian Plateau, Turkey. In South Asia, along the footprints of the Kanga, Ganges, Brahmaputra, Indus, and Irati rivers, sorry if I mispronounced, Assam, Bangladesh, Burma, and North India. In China, along the floodplain of the Huanghe, Yellow River, in the Americans, in Mesoamerica, the middle belt of the Americas that extends north to the North American, southwest and south to the Isthmus of Panama, around Tamaulipas and the Tehucan Valley, Mexico, in Arizona and New Mexico, and along the western slopes of the Andes in South America. The transition of food producing mini systems had several important implications for the long term evolution of the world's geographies. It allowed much higher population densities and encouraged the proliferation of settled vi villages. It brought about a change in social organization from loose communal systems to systems that were more highly organized on the basis of kinship. Kin groups provided a natural way of assigning rights over land and resources and of organizing patterns of land use. It allowed some specialization in non-agricultural crafts, such as pottery, woven textiles, jewelry, and weaponry. Specialization led to a fourth development in the 
the beginnings of barter and trade between communities, sometimes over substantial distances. Most mini systems vanished a long time ago, although some remnants have survived to provide material for discovery channel and Dis for discovery channel and national geographic specials. Examples of these residual and fast disappearing mini systems are the Bushmen of the Kalar Kalahari, the hill tribes of Papua New Guinea, and the tribes of the Amazon rainforest. They contribute powerfully to regional different differentiation and sense of place in a few enclaves around the world, but their most important contribution to contemporary human geographies is that they provide a stark counterpoint to the landscapes and practices of the rest of the contemporary world. Here's the picture for this section. read them. The growth of early empires. <clears throat> the higher population densities, changes in social organization, craft production, and trade brought by, about by the first agricultural revolution provided, by the, provided the preconditions for the emergence of several world empires. Unquote. A world empire is a group of many systems that have been absorbed into a common political system in world empires. Wealth flows from producer classes to an elite class in the form of taxes or tribute. This redistribution of wealth is most often achieved through military coercion, religious persuasion, or a combination of the two. The best known world empires were the largest and longest lasting of the ancient civilizations, Egypt, Greece, China, Byzantine, and Rome. These world empires brought about brought important new elements to the evolution of the world's geographies. One was the emergence of colonization. The other was urbanization. Colonization. Colonization, the physical settlement in a new territory of people from a colonizing state was in part an direct, indirect consequence of the operation of the law of diminishing returns. This law refers to the tendency for productivity to decline after a certain point with the continued addition of capital and or labor was to a given resource base. World empires could support growing populations only if overall levels of productivity could be increased, while some productivity gains could be achieved through better agricultural practices, harder work and improvements in farm technology, a fixed resource base meant that as populations grew, overall levels productivity fell. For each additional person working the land, the gain in production per worker was less. The usual response of empire builders to these diminishing returns was to large the resource, enlarge the resource base by colonizing nearby land. This colonization had immediate spatial consequences in terms of establishing dominant subordinate spatial relationships between world empires and colonies. Colonization played a role in establishing hierarchies of settlements and creating improved transportation networks as well. The military underpinnings of colonization also meant that new towns and cities came to be carefully cited for strategic and defensive reasons. The legacy of these important changes is still apparent in today's landscapes. The clearest examples are in Europe, where the Roman world empire colonized an extensive territory that was controlled through a highly developed system of towns and connecting roads. Most of today's important Western European cities had their origins as Roman settlements, and quite a few it is possible to trace the original street layer layouts in some of it in some it is possible to glimpse remnants of roman defensive city walls paved streets aqueducts viaducts air arenas sewage systems baths and public buildings in the modern european countryside we can still read 
the legacy of the Roman world empire in arrow straight roads built by Roman engineers and maintained by successful generations. Here is the next picture for this area. Some colonial world empires were exceptional in that they were based on a particularly strong central state with total totalitarian rulers who were able to organize large-scale com communal land improvement schemes. These world empires were found in China, India, the Middle East, Central America, and the Andean region of South America. Most of them relied heavily on slave labor. Their development of large-scale land improvement schemes, particularly irrigation and drainage schemes, as the basis for agricultural productivity has led some scholars to characterize them as hydraulic societies. Today, their legacy can be seen in the landscape of terraced fields in places like Sikkim, India, and East Java, Indonesia. Early geographers, these are early, these early world empires were also significant in developing a base of geographic knowledge. Greek scholars, for example, developed the idea that places embody fundamental relationships between people and the natural environment, and that the study of geography provides the best way of addressing the interdependencies between places and between people and nature. The Greeks were also among the first to to appreciate the practical importance and utility of geographic knowledge, not least in politics, business, and trade. The word geography is in fact derived from the Greek language, the literal translation meaning earth writing or earth describing. As Greek civilization developed, descriptive geographic writing came to be an essential tool for recording information about sea and land routes and for preparing colonists and merchants for the challenges and opportunities of faraway places. Urbanization. Towns and cities became essential as centers of administration. For early world empires, towns served as military garrisons and as theological centers for the ruling classes who used a combination of military and theological authority to hold their empires together. While these early world empires were successful, they gave rise not only to monumental capital cities, but also to a whole series of smaller settlements which acted as intermediate centers in the flow of tribute and taxes from colonized territories. The most successful world empires, such as the Greek and Roman, established quite extensive urban systems. In general, the settlements in these urban systems were not very large, typically ranging from a few thousand inhabitants to about 20,000. The seats of new empire grew quite large. However, the Mesopotamian city of Uruguay in present-day Iraq, for example, has been es estimated to have reached a population of around 200,000 by 2100 BCE, and Thebes, the capital of Egypt, is thought to have had more than 200,000 inhabitants. In 1600 BCE, Athens and Corinth the largest cities of ancient Greece had populations between 50,000 and 100,000 by 400 BCE. Rome, at the height of the Roman Empire around CE 200, may have had as many as a million inhabitants. The most impressive thing about these cities, though, was not so much their size as their degree of sophistication. Elaborately laid out, with paved streets, piped water sewage systems, massive monuments, grand public buildings, and impressive city walls. The Geography of the Pre-Modern World. Figure 2.4. Okay, so you can see 
I guess that's in the next section. I'm sorry. Shows the generalized framework of human geographies in the Old World as they existed around 1400 CE. The following characteristics of this period are important. One, harsher environments in continental interiors were still characterized by isolated subsidence level hunting and gathering mini systems. Two, the dry belt of steppes and desert margins stretching across the Old World from the Western Sahara to Mongolia was a continuous zone of pastoral mini systems. Many systems based on herding animals, usually moving with the animals from the one grazing area to another. Three, the principal areas of sedentary agricultural production with permanently settled farmers extended in discontinuous arc from Morocco to China. With two main outliers not shown on the map in figure 2.4 in the central Andes and in Mesoamerica, the dominant centers of global civilization were China, Northern India, both of them hydraulic society, variants of world empires and the Ottoman empires of the Eastern Mediterranean. They were all linked by the Silk Road a series of overland trade routes between China and Mediterranean Europe from Roman times until Portuguese navigators found their way around Africa and established seaborne trade routes. The Silk Road provided the main east-west trade route between Europe and China. This shifting trail of caravan tracks facilitated the exchange of silk spices and porcelain from the east and gold precious stones and Venetian glass. From the west, the ancient cities of Samarkand, Bukhara, and Kiva stood along the Silk Road, places of glory and wealth that astonished Western travelers such as Marco Polo in the 13th century. These cities were east-west meeting places for philosophy, knowledge, and religion. And in their prime, they were known for producing scholars in mathematics, music, architecture, and astronomy, such as al Khwarizm, 780-847, Al-Biruni, 973-1048, and Ibn Sind, 980-1037. This city's prosperity was marked by impressive feats of Islamic architecture. By 1400 CE, other important world empires had developed in Southeast Asia, in Muslim city states of, the co of coastal North Africa, in the grasslands of West Africa, and the gold and copper mines of East Africa, and the feudal kingdoms and merchant towns of Europe. Over time, all of these were more developed realms were interconnected through trade, which meant that several emerging centers of capitalism came into existence. Capitalism is a form of economic and social organization. Characterized by the profit mo motive and the control of the means of production, distribution, and exchange of goods by private ownership, Port cities were particularly important to capitalism. Among the leading leader centers were the city-state of Venice, the Hanseatic League of in Independent City-States in Northwestern Europe, figure 2.6, and Cairo, Calicut, Canton, and Malacca in North Africa and Asia. Traders in these port cities began to organize the production of agricultural specialties, textiles, and craft products in their respective hinter hinterlands. The hinterland of a town or city is its sphere of economic influence, the area from which it collects products to be exported and through which it distributes imports. By the 15th century, several established regions of budding capitalism existed. Northern Italy, Flanders, Southern England, the Baltic Sea region, the Nile Valley, Malabar, Coromandel, Bengal, 
northern Java, and southeast coastal China. Here are the pictures of the areas. And then here's figure, I'm sorry, 2.6. The expansion of geographic knowledge. Between roughly 500 and 1400 CE, geographic knowledge was preserved and expanded by Chinese and Islamic scholars. Chinese maps of the world from the same period were more accurate than those of European cartographers. Because the Chinese were able to draw on information brought back by Imperial China's admirals, who successfully navigated much of the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Chinese geographers recognized, for example, that Africa was a southward pointing triangle, whereas on European and Arabic maps of the time, it was represented as pointing eastward. With the rise of Islamic power in the Middle East and the Mediterranean, in the 17th and 8th century CE, centers of scholarship emerged in places such as Baghdad, Damascus, Cairo, and Grenada, Spain. Here, surviving Greek and Roman text were translated into Arabic by scholars such as al-Batani, al-Fargani, and al-Khwarizmi. These Islamic scholars were also able to draw on Chinese geographical writing and the cartography brought back by tra traders along the Silk Road. The requirement that the Islamic religious, faithful, and undertake at least one pilgrimage to Mecca created a demand for travel guidebooks. It also brought scholars from all over the Arab at world into contact with one another, stimulating considerable debate over different philosophical views of the world and of the people's relationship with nature. <clears throat> Excuse me. An interdependent world geography. When exploration beyond European shores began to be seen as an important way of opening up new opportunities for trade and economic expansion, a modern world system emerged. A world system is an interdependent system of countries linked by political and economic competition. The term world system, which was coined by historian Emanuel Wallerstein, is hyphenated to emphasize the interdependence of places and regions around the world. By the 16th century, new techniques of shipbuilding and navigation had begun to bind more and more places and regions together through trade and political competition. As a result, more and more peoples around the world were exposed to one another's technology, technologies and ideas, their different resources, social structures, and cultural systems resulted in quite different pathways of development. However, some societies were incorporated into the new European-based international economic system faster than others. I will come back to this section. Some resisted incorporation and some sought alternative systems of economic and political organization. Australia and New Zealand, for example, were discovered by Europeans only in the late 18th century and were barely penetrated, if at all, by the European world system Regions not yet absorbed into the world system are called external arenas. Here is the area. Here is the section on 2.1.
trade and merchant capitalism. With the emergence of this modern world system at the beginning of the 16th century, a whole new geography began to emerge. Although several regions of budding capitalist production existed, and although Imperial China could boast of sophisticated achievements in science, technology, and navigation, it was European merchant capitalism that reshaped the world. Several factors motivated European overseas expansion, a relatively high density population and a limited amount of cultivable, cultivatable land meant that it was continu a continuous struggle to provide enough food. Meanwhile, the desire of, for overseas expansion was intensified both by competition among a large number of small monarchies and by inheritance laws that produced large numbers of impoverished aristocrats. With little or no land of their own, many of these landless nobles were eager to set out for adventure and profit. Added to these motivation, motivating factors were the enabling factors of innovations and sh in shipbuilding, navigation, and gunnery. In the mid-1400s, for example, the Portuguese developed a Candon armed ship, the Caraval, that could sail anywhere defend itself against pirates, pose a threat to those who were initially unwilling to trade, and carry enough goods to be profitable. Naval power enabled the Portuguese and the Spanish to enrich their economies with gold and silver plundered from the Americas. The Quadrant 1450 and the Astro Astrolabe 1480 enabled accurate navigation and mapping of ocean currents, prevailing winds, and trade routes. Europeans embarked on a succession of voyages of discovery, seeking out new products and new markets. The European voyages of discovery can be traced to Portugal's Prince Henry, the navigator who set up a school of navigation and financed numerous expeditions with the objective circumnavigating Africa to establish a profitable sea route for spices from India. The knowledge of winds, ocean, currents, natural harbors, and watering places amassed by Henry's captains was an essential foundation for the subsequent voyages of Cristobal Colon, Columbus, de Gama, de Magalhães, Magellan, and others, the end of the European Age of Discovery was marked by Captain James, James Cook's voyages to the Pacific. Equipped with better maps and navigation techniques, Europeans sent adventurers, adventurers in search of gold and silver and also to commander, commandeer land, decided, or decide on its use and exploit coerced labor to produce high-value crops, such as sugar, cocoa, cotton, and indigo. On platforms, large land holdings that usually specialize in the production of one particular crop. For market, from the 16th to early, the early 19th centuries, Trade was dominated by two systems. One was the triangular trade system among Europe, West Africa, and the Caribbean, and the eastern seaboard of North America. West African states sold their slaves to merchants who transported them to plantation owners in North America and Brazil. Sugar, rum, and indigo was shipped from Caribbean plantations to Europe and tobacco and cotton were shipped from the virgins for, from Virginia and the Carolinas to Europe. The triangle was completed as European goods were exported to West Africa. Those regions whose populations were resistant to European disease and which also had high pro population densities. A good resource base and strong governments were able to keep Europeans at arm's length. For the most part, these regions were in South and East Asia. 
Their dealings with <clears throat> Europeans constituted the second major trading network conducted through a series of coastal trading stations. Textiles were an important commodity as reflected by the origin of certain words in the English language. The word satin comes from the name of an unknown city in China that Arab traders called Zetan. Zetan, khaki, is the Hindu word for dusty. The word calico comes from India's southwestern coastal city of Calicut, Shins, from the Hindi name for a printed calico, Kashmir. From Kashmir, perkale comes from the e from the Farsi word pargola, another Farsi derivative is seersucker, whose bands of alternating smooth and puckered fabric prompted a name that literally means milk and sugar. Still another Farsi borrowing is taffeta, which comes from the Farsi for spun, the coarse cloth we call muslim is named for Mosul, the town in Iraq, while Damask is short for form of Damascus. Cotton takes its name from Ketan, the Arabic name of fiber. Within Europe, I'm sorry. Within Europe, meanwhile, innovations in business and finance, e.g. banking, loan systems, credit transfers, commercial insurance, and courier services helped increase savings, investment, and commercial activity. European merchants and manufacturers also became adept to import substitution. Copying and making goods previously available only by trading, the result was the emergence of Western Europe as the core region of a world system that had penetrated and incorporated significant portions of the rest of the world. For Europe, this overseas expansion stimulated, stimulated still further improvements in technology. These included new developments in nautical map making, naval artiller, artillery, shipbuilding, and sailing. The whole experience of overseas expansion also provided a great practical school for entrepreneurship and investment. In this way, the self-propelling growth of merchant capitalism was intensified and consolidated. For the periphery, European overseas expansion met dependency as it has higher has ever since for many of the world's peripheral regions. At worst, territory was forcibly occupied and labor systematically exploited. At best, local traders were displaced by Europeans who imposed their own terms of economic exchange. Europeans soon destroyed most of the Muslim shipping trade in the Indian Ocean, for example, and went on to capture a large share of the ocean-going trade within Asia, selling Japanese copper to China and India. Persian carpets to India and Indian cotton textiles to Japan. Technology and sorry and the limitations. As revolutionary as these changes were, however, they were constrained by a technology that rested on wind and water power, on wooden ships and structures, and on wood for fuel. Grain mills, for example, were built of wood and powered by water or wind. They could generate only modest amounts of power and only at sites determined by physical, physical geography, not human choice. Within the relatively small European landmass, wood grown for structural use and for fuel competed for acreage with food and textile, fiber crops, more important, however, were the inherent limits on, in the size and strength of timber, which imposed structural limits on the size of buildings, the diameter of water wheels, the span of bridges, and so on. In particular, it 
impose limits on the size and design of ships, which in turn impose limits on the volume and velocity of world trade. The expense and relative inefficiency of horse or ox-drawn wagons for overland transportation also meant that for a long time, the European world system could penetrate into continental interiors only along major rivers. After 300 years of evolution, roughly between 1450 and 1750, the world system had incorporated only parts of the world. The principal spheres of European influence were Mediterranean, North Africa, Portuguese, and Spanish colonies in Central and South America, Indian ports and trading colonies, the East Indies, African and Chinese ports, the Greater Caribbean and British and French territories in North America. The rest of the world functioning functioned more or less as before, with slow changing geographies based on modified mini systems and world empires that were only partially and intermittently penetrated by market trading. <clears throat> Core and periphery in the new world system. With the new production and transportation technologies of the Industrial Revolution, from the late 1700s, capitalism began to grow into a global system that reached into virtually every part of the inhabited world <clears throat> and into virtually every aspect of people's lives. It is important to recognize that the Industrial Revolution was really an extended transition of to new forms of organization and new technologies and that its effects were uneven, reflecting the influence of principles of spatial organization in Europe the cradle of the Industrial Revolution, it took part of a central for industrialization to work its way across European landscapes with, <clears throat> excuse me, with very different outcomes for different regions. The Industrialization of Europe. The Industrial Revolution began in England toward the end of the 18th century and eventually resulted not only in the complete reorganization of the geography of the original European core of the world system, but also in an extensive extension of the world system core to the United States and Japan. In Europe, three distinctive waves of industrialization occurred. The first between 1790 and 1850 was based on the initial cluster of industrial technologies, steam engines, cotton textiles, and iron worker working, and was localized. It was limited to a few regions in Britain where industrial entrepreneurs and workforces had first exploited key innovations and the availability of key resources, coal, iron ore, water. Although these regions shared a common in, impetuous of certain key innovations, each of them retained its own technological traditions and industrial style. From the start, then, industrialization was a regional scale phenomenon. The second wave of industrialization between about 1850 and 1870 involved the diffusion of industrialization to most of the rest of Britain and to parts of the northwestern Northwest Europe, particularly the coal fields of northern France, Belgium, and Germany. This second wave also brought a certain amount of change to the geographies of first wave industrial regions as new technologies. Steel, machine tools, railroads, steamships brought new opportunities, new locomotion requirements, new business structures, and new forms of societal organization. Railroads and steamships made more place, places accessible, bringing their resources and their markets into the sphere of industrialization. These new activities brought some significant changes to the logic of industrial location. 
the importance of railway networks, for example, attracted industry away from smaller towns on the local canal system systems to toward larger towns with good rail connections. The importance of steamships for coastal and international trade attracted industry to larger ports. At the same time, the importance of steel produced concentrations of heavy industry in places that had nearby supplies of coal, iron ore, and limestone. By the outbreak of the First World War in 1914, industrialization had spread to parts of southern and eastern Europe where there were coal fields, concentrations of population, and good transport connections. The scale of industry increased as improved technologies and transportation made larger markets accessible to firms. Local family firms became smaller, small companies that were regional in scope. Small companies grew to become powerful firms serving national markets. Specialized business, legal, and financial services emerged within larger cities. The growth of new occupations transformed the structure of social classes, and the transformation in turn was reflected in the politics and landscapes of industrial regions. Sorry. Colonialism and imperialism. Human geographers were, were recast again, this time with a more interdependent dynamic new production technologies based on more efficient energy sources helped raise levels of productivity and create new and better products that stimulated demand, increased profits, and created a pool of capital for further investment. New transportation technologies tr triggered successful successive phases of geographic expansions, allowing for internal development <clears throat> as well as for external colonization and imperialism. The deliberate exercise of military power and economic influence by powerful states to advance and secure their national interests. See chapter 8. Since the 17th century, the world system has been consolidated with stronger economic ties between countries. It has also been extended with all the world's countries, eventually becoming involved to some extent in the interdependence of the capitalist system. Although there have been some instances of resistance and adaptation, the overall result is that a highly structured relationship between places and regions has emerged. This relationship is organized around three tiers, core, semi-peripheral, and peripheral regions. These broad geographic divisions have evolved and are still evolving through a combination of processes of private economic competition and competition among states. The core state regions of the world system at any given time are those that dominate trade, control the most technolo technologies, and have high levels of productivity within diversified economies. <clears throat> As a result, they enjoy relatively high per capita trading hubs <clears throat> of Holland and England, Joined soon afterward by France by the end of 19, the 19th century, <clears throat> the core of the world system had extended to include the United States and Japan, and today it includes Scandinavia and most of Western Europe. But the continuing success of core re regions depends on their dominance and exploitation of other regions. This dominance, in turn, depends on the participation of these other regions within the world system. Initially, such participation was achieved by military enforcement than by European colonialism. Colonialism involves the establishment and maintenance of political and legal domination by a state over a 
separate and alien society. This domination usually involves some colonization, i.e. the physical settlement of people from the colonizing state, and always results in economic exploitation by the colonizing state. After World War II, the sheer economic and political influence of the core regions was sufficient to maintain their dominance without political and legal control, and colonialism was gradually phased out. Regions that have remained economically and politically unsuccessful throughout this process of incorporation into the world system are peripheral. Peripheral regions are characterized by characterized by dependent and disadvantaged trading relationships by primitive or obsolescent technologies and by underdeveloped, undeveloped or narrowly specialized economies with low levels of productivity. Transitional between core regions and peripheral regions are semi-peripheral regions. Semi-peripheral regions are able to exploit peripheral regions, but are themselves exploited and dominated by core regions. They consist mostly of countries that were once peripheral. The existence of this semi-peripheral category underlines the fact that nearly peripheral status nor core status is necessarily permanent. The United States and Japan both achieved core status after having been peripheral. Spain and Portugal, part of the original core in the 16th century, became semi-peripheral in the 19th century, but are now once more part of the core. Quite a few countries, including Brazil, India, Mexico, South Korea and Taiwan have become semi-peripheral after first having been incorporated into the periphery of the world systems and then developing a successful manufacturing sector. An important dominant of these changes in status is the effectiveness of states in ensuring the international competitiveness of their domestic producers. They can do so, do this in several ways manipulating markets, e.g. protecting domestic manufacturers by charging taxes on imports, regulating their economies, example, enacting laws that help establish stable labor markets, creating physical and social infrastructures, spending public funds on road systems, ports, educational systems, etc., because some states are more successful than others in pursuing these strategies, the hierarchy of the geographical tiers is not rigid. Rather, it is fluid, providing a continually changing framework for geographical transformation within individual places and regions. Here is the map. Leadership Cycles The colonization and imperialism that accompanied the expansion of the world system was closely tied to the evolution of the world leadership cycles. Leadership cycles are periods of international power established by individual states through economic, political, and military competition. In the long term, success in the world system depends on economic strength and competitiveness, which brings political influence and pays for military strength. With a combination of economic, political, and military power, individual states can dominate the world system, setting the terms for many economic and cultural practices and imposing their, their particular ideology by virtue of their preeminence. The modern world system has so far experienced several distinct leadership cycles. In simplified terms, they have involved dominance by Portugal for the most for most of the 16th century, the Netherlands for the first three quarters of the 17th centuries, century, Great Britain from the early 18th century through the early 20th century, and the United States from the 1950s. See Chapter 11. This kind of dominance is known as a hegemony. 
Hegemony refers to the to domination over the world economy, exercised through a combination of economic, military, financial, and cultural means by one national state in, in a particular historical epoch over the long run. The costs of maintaining this kind of power and influence tend to weaken the hegemony. This phase of cycle when the dominant nation is weakened is known as imperial overstretch. It is followed by another period of competitive struggle, which brings the possibility of a new dominant world power organizing periphery. The growth and internal development of the core region simply could not have taken place without the foodstuffs, raw materials, and markets provided by the colonization of the periphery, per periphery and the incorporation of more and more territory into the sphere of industrial capitalism. Early in the 19th century, the industrial core embarks, core nations embark on the penetration <clears throat> excuse me, of the world's inland mid-continental grassland zones to exploit them for grain or livestock production. This led to the settlement through the immigration of European peoples of the temperature, temperate prairies of and pompous of the Americas, the Vale, the Veld in southern Africa, the Moray Darling Plain in Austria, Australia, and the Canterbury Plain in New Zealand. At the same time, as the demand for tropical plantation products, e.g. sugar, cotton, coffee, cocoa, and rubber, increased most of the tropical world came under the political and economic control, direct or indirect, of one or another of the industrial core nations in the second half of the 19th century. And especially after 1870, there was a vast increase in the number of colonies and the number of people under co colonial rule. The international division of labor. The fundamental logic behind all this colonization was economic. The need for an extended arena for trade and area and uh, an arena that could supply foodstuffs and raw materials in return for the industrial goods of the core. The outcome was an international division of labor driven by the needs of the core and imposed through its economic and military strength. The division of labor involved the specialization of different people, regions, and countries in certain kinds of economic activities. In particular, colonies began to specialize in the production of commodities meeting certain criteria. Where an established demand existed in the industrial core, e.g. foodstuff for foodstuffs and industrial raw materials, where colonies held a comparative advantage in specializations that did not duplicate or compete with the domestic suppliers within core counties, countries, e.g. tropical agriculture, cultural products like cocoa and bananas, simply could not be grown in core countries. The result was that colonial economies were found on narrow specializations that were oriented to and develop, dependent upon the needs of core countries. Examples of these specializations were many bananas in Central America, cotton in India, coffee in Brazil, Java in Kenya, copper in Chile, cocoa in Ghana, jute in East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, palm oil in West Africa, rubber in Malaya, Malaya, now Malaysia, and Sumatra, sugar in the Caribbean islands, tea in Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, tin in Bolivia, and bauxite in Guyana and Suriname. Most of these specializations persist, persist today. For example, 45 of the 55 countries in sub-Saharan Africa still depend on just three products, tea, cocoa, and coffee. For more than half of their export earnings, this new global economic geography took some time to establish and the new details of the pattern and timing were heavily influenced by technological innovations. 
the incorporation of the temperate grasslands into the commercial orbit of the core countries, for example, involved changes in regional landscapes resulting from critical innovations such as barbed wire, the railroad, and refrigeration. The single most important innovation stimulating the international division of labor, however, was the development of metal-hulled ocean-going steamships. This development was cumulative with improvements in engine bo engines, boilers, transmission systems, fuel systems, and construction materials adding up to produce dramatic improvements in carrying capacity, speed, range, and reliability. The Suez Canal opened in 1869 and the Panama Canal opened in 1914 were also critical, providing shorter and less hazardous routes between the core countries and colonial ports of call. By the eve of World War I, the world economy was effectively integrated by a system of regularly scheduled steamship trading routes. This integration, in turn, was supported by the second most important innovation, stimulating the international division of labor, a network of telegraph communications that enabled businesses to monitor and co coordinate supply and demand across vast distances on an hourly basis. The International Division of Labor brought about a substantial increase in trade and a huge surge in the overall size of the capitalist world economy. The peripheral regions of the world contributed a great deal to this growth. By 1913, Africa and Asia provided more exports to the world economy than either North America or the British Isles. Asia alone was importing almost as much by value as North America. The industrialization, industrializing countries of the core brought increasing amounts of foodstuffs and raw materials from the periphery financed by profits from the export of machinery and manufactured goods. Britain and the hegemon hegemonic power of the period drew on a trading empire that was truly global. Patterns of international trade and interdependence became increasingly complex. Britain used its capital to invest not only in peripheral regions, but also in profitable industries in other core countries, especially the United States at the same time. These other core countries were able to export manufa cheap manufactured items to Britain, Britain financed the purchase of these goods together with imports of food from its, dom its Dominion states, Canada, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand, and colonies through the export of its own manufactured goods to peripheral count countries. India and China, with large domestic markets, were especially important a widening circle of exchange and dependence developed with constantly shifting patterns of trade and investment. Imperialism, imposing new geographies on the world. The incorporation of the periphery means by, was by no means entirely motivated by, the ba by this basic logic of free trade and investment. Although Britain was the dominant power in the late 19th century, several other European countries, notably Germany, France, and the Netherlands, together with the United States, and later Japan, were competing for global influence. This competition developed into a scramble for territorial and commercial domination. The core countries engaged in preemptive geographic expansionism <clears throat> to protect their established interest and to limit the opportunities of others. They also wanted to secure as much of the world as possible. Through a combination of military oversight, administrative control, and economic re regulation to ensure stable and profitable environments for their traders and investors, this combination of circumstances defined a new era of imperialism in the final quarter of the 19th century. 
Africa, more than any other peripheral region, was given an entirely new geography. It was carved up into a patchwork of European colonies and protector protectorates in just 34 years. Between 1880 and 1914, figure 2.3, or 2.13, with little regard for other ge physical geography or the pre-existing mini systems and world empires, whereas European interest had been pre had previously focused on coastal tra trading stations and garrison ports, it now extended to the entire continent. I'm going to go ahead because this is going to chop up so that you can see this. Within just a few years, the whole of Africa incorporated into, and I'll get back to that one, modern systems of the geography that consisted of a hierarchy of three kinds of spaces. One consisted of regions and localities organized by European colonial administrators and European investors to produce a co commodities for the world market. A second consisted of zones of production for local markets where peasant farmers produced food for consumption by laborers engaged in commercial mining and agriculture. The third consisted of widespread regions of subsistence <clears throat> agriculture whose connections with the world system was a, as a source of labor for the commercial regions. Meanwhile, the major powers also jostled, jostled and squabbed, squabbled over small Pacific islands that had suddenly became, become valuable uh, as strategic coaling stations for their navies and merchant fleets. Resistance from ing indigenous peoples was quickly brushed aside by imperial navies with ironclad steamers, high explosive guns, and troops with rifles. <clears throat> and cannons, European weaponry, was so superior that Otto von Bismarck, the founder and first chancellor, 1871 to 1890, of the German Empire, referred to these conflicts as sporting wars. Between 1870 and 1900, European countries added almost 22 million square kilometers, 8.5 million square miles, and 150 million people to their spheres of control. 20% of the Earth's land surface, and 10% of its population. The imprint of imperialism and colonization on the geographies of the newly incorporated peripheries of the world system was immediate and profound. The periphery was rendered almost entirely dependent on European and North American capital. Shipping, managerial expertise, financial services, and news communications. Consequently, it also became dependent on European cultural products, language, education, science, religion, architecture, and planning. All of these influences were etched into the landscapes of the periphery in a variety of ways as, an, as new places were created. Old places were remade and regions were reorganized. Here's the map on this. Geography and Imperialism. The discipline of geography played an important role in providing a scientific rationale for the do domination and peripheral countries by Europeans and North Americans. Prominent geographers argued that civilization and unsuccessful economic development are largely the result of invigorating temperate, temperate climates with mark seasonal variations and varied weather, but without prolonged extremes of heat, humidity, or cold. Conversely, tropical climates, they asserted, limit, oh, I'm so sorry. North, prominent geographer argues civilization and successful economic development are largely the result of invigorating temperature, temperate climates with marked seasonal variations and varied weather but without prolonged extremes of heat, humidity, or cold. 
Conversely, tropical climates, they asserted, limit people's vitality. This kind of reasoning reflects an underlying ethnocentrism and environmental de determinism. Ethocentricism is the attitude that one's own race and culture are superior to those of others. Environmental determinism is a doctrine holding that human activities are shaped and constrained by the environment. Most of the geographic writing in the 19th and early 20th century centuries were strongly influenced by this assumption that the physical attributes of geographical settings are the root not only of people's physical differences, but also of differences in people's economic vitality, cultural activities, and social structures. The struggle for, inter for independence. The, this imperial, <clears throat> excuse me, the imperial world of order began to disintegrate shortly after World War II. However, the United States emerged as the new hegemonic power, the dominant state within the world system core, the Soviet Union and China opting for alter alternative socialist paths of development for themselves and their satellite countries, were seen as second world withdrawn from the capitalist world economy their pursuit of alternative political economies was based on radically different values. By the 1950s, many of the old European colonies began to seek political interdependent independence. Some of the early independence struggles were very bloody because the colonial powers were initially reluctant to withdraw from colonies where strategic resources or large numbers of European settlers were involved in Kenya in the early 1950s. For example, a militant nationalist movement known as the Mau Mau launched a campaign of terrorism, sabotage, and assassination against British colonists. They killed more than 2,000 white settlers between 1952 and 1956. In return, 11,000 Mau Mau re re rebels were killed by the colonial, colonial army and 20,000 put into detention camps by the colonial administration. By the early 1960s, however, the process of decolonization had become relatively smooth. In 1962, Jomo Kenyatta, who had been jailed as a Mau Mau leader in 1953, became prime minister of a newly independent Kenya. The periphery of the world system now consisted of politically independent states, some of which adopted a policy of non-alignment. That is, they were not formally aligned with or against either the United States or the Soviet Union. Neocolonialism and Transnational Corporations As newly independent peripheral states struggled from the 1960s onward to be free of their economic dependence, through industrialization, modernization, and trade, the capitalist world system became increasingly integrated and interdependent. The old imperial patterns of international trade broke down and were replaced by more complex patterns. Nevertheless, the newly independent states were still influenced by many of the old colonial links and legacies that remained intact. The result of neocolonial pattern and international development. Neocolonialism refers to economic and political strategies by which powerful states and core economies indirectly maintain or extend their influence over the over other areas or people instead of formal direct rule. Colonialism controls are exerted through such strategies as international financial regulations, commercial relations, and covert, covert intelligent opera, intelligence operations. Through neocolonialism, the human geographies of peripheral counties, countries continue to be heavily shaped by the linguistic, cultural, political, and 
institutional influence of the former colonial powers, as well as by their investment and trading activities. At about the same time, a new form of imperialism was emerging. This was the commercial imperialism of giant corporations. These corporations had grown within the core countries through the elimination of smaller firms by mergers and takeovers by the 1960s. Quite a few of them had become so big that they were transnational <clears throat> in scope having established overseas oh gosh sorry taken uh, subsidiaries taken over foreign com competitors or simply brought bought into profitable foreign businesses this transnational corporation have investments and activities that span international boundaries with subsidiary companies factories, offices, or facilities in several countries. Examples of transnational corporations include Airbus, BP, Hol Hollyburton, News Corporation, Siemens, and the Virgin Group. By 2007, over 79,000 transnational corporations were operating, 90% of which were headquartered in the core states. These corporations control about 790,000 foreign affiliates and account for the equivalent of 11% of the world gross domestic product, the GDP, and one-third of the world exports. Transnational corporations have been portrayed as imperialist by some geographers because of their ability and willingness to exercise their considerable power in ways that adversely affect peripheral states. They have certainly been central to a major new phase of geographical restructuring that has been taken place for the last 35 years or so. This phase has been distinctive because of an unprecedented amount of economic, political, social, and cultural activity has spilled beyond the geographic and institutional boundaries of states. It is a phase of globalization and a much fuller integration of economies of the worldwide system of states and a much greater interdependence of individual places and regions from every part of the world system. This is the end of part one, chapter two.